Hello and welcome to Allied Health Virtual Conference, uncovering your expertise with the lovely Jo Muirhead. Thank you so much for joining us, whether it's live or you're catching the recording, welcome. I am Serena Jones, I'm the Director at Allied Health Support Services and the co-founder here at Allied Health Virtual Conference. I will be your host for this session today. A little bit of housekeeping first up. Uh, if you've got questions, fab, we want to hear them. We'd love you to ask questions. And I'm sure Jo would be super delighted to, to field your questions. Just so you know, we need you to use the chat function on the right side of your screen there. The Q&A function is not monitored, okay? We will be holding all the questions. I'll be managing the questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, participants should be on mute and your video feed should be turned off. So don't worry, we can't see you. Um, if for some reason, I would really appreciate it, if you, pre appreciate it if you do double check the mute thing, just in case, please make sure it is. Uh, and lastly, please be respectful to your colleagues and your peers. We're all here to learn and to have a bit of a laugh. So I do re res um, reserve the right to remove you from the webinar if there's any disrespectful behaviour. Okie dokie, without further ado, Jo Muirhead. Jo is all about connecting people to purpose through inspiration and innovation. Sounds pretty cool, hey? She's the founder, she's the director and principal consultant of Purple Co, which is a team of specialist allied health consultants dedicated to helping people reclaim their lives through work. Jo is passionate about what she does and she's an absolute delight to work with. So without further ado, over to you now, Jo. Hey, thanks, Serena. I really appreciated your welcome. I thought I would turn my video on for you for a little moment, just so you can see I'm a real person and that this is happening in real time. Um, I have been fighting with my hair today. I uh, just thought I'd let you know that. And I'm um, really looking forward to delivering this. This has been an amazing opportunity. I am so grateful. I, I actually, uh, secret, not going to be a secret for very much longer. I have a bit of a girl crush on Serena. I think she has built something incredible. And when I saw what she was doing, I think I was one of her first fast followers where I was like, I want to know what's going on here and I want to be a part of the change that she's going to create. So I don't know about you, but I've always struggled to find relevant, useful, fun, professional development. And I think she's putting that together in a way that's awesome. So I want to help with that today. So we discussed a range of things that I could talk about and today I'm going to talk about uncovering your expertise and why we should even care but I'm going to turn my video off because I have got a slideshow for us to enjoy and I'm just going to work out how we turn said slideshow off no video doesn't want to turn off now oh there it is found the video button so I'm going to talk to you but you're not going to see me now okay so uncovering your expertise. I don't know about you, but when you hear the word expert, what types of things come up in your mind? Have you ever thought of yourself as an expert? Does it make you feel cringy? Does it make you feel awkward? Does it make you go, damn right, I'm an expert? It's a really, really loaded word. Uh, and I wanna unpack that today and help you understand why in 2018, it's important for us as health professionals to understand that we have a level of expertise and that we're not being arrogant and we're not being rude and we're not being disrespectful, that actually the marketplace, employers, prospective clients, customers, they're all wanting our expertise. So that's what we're going to uncover today. And I'm going to help you uncover your expertise. I've got a two step process that's going to help you do that. So by the end of this session today, I hope you will have some clarity around your expertise. It probably will bring up some uncomfortable feelings for you. Don't be afraid of those. That's to be expected because in anything professional and personal development, it means we're actually stretching and growing and putting ourselves in a position for growth and change. We expect growth and change of our clients consistently. We need to be expecting it of ourselves as well. So I'm going to share with a couple of stories about being the expert. So in 2012, I sustained a really nasty injury to my right hip and my back. 
You see, I turned 40 in the year 2012, and I thought it would be a smart thing to do to learn how to run <laughs> the trails in the Blue Mountains. So I live in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, and I've never, ever been an endurance, endurance athlete. So I turned 40 and thought, I think I should become one because 40 tends to do that to you. So I knew that learning to run was going to hurt because anytime you speak to anybody about learning to run, they tell you how much it hurts. Uh, I engaged a trainer and we started off around an oval and that hurt a lot. And um, in about eight months, I was running for two, two and a half hours through the far trails in the Blue Mountains and I loved it. It was stunning. But what happened was I was experiencing so much pain that I was swallowing Celebrex before and after a run. And anyone who knows what that medication is, that's not smart. And I decided uh, after some prompting that I needed to go and speak to somebody about it. And what we actually discovered was that I was staring down the barrel of a hip replacement at 40 and that did not excite me. So I live in the greater west of Sydney where we have a large teaching hospital. So my GP did her thing and just wanted to refer me out to an orthopedic surgeon. Now a little bit about my background, uh, I'm a rehabilitation counsellor, so I only ever get to meet people when they've had failed surgeries uh, or surgeries that haven't resulted in the types of gains that they wanted. So hip replacement, Orthopedic surgeon surgery was freaking me out. So I did what any patient does these days when we get recommended to a specialist of some kind. I consulted Dr. Google because I wanted to find somebody who was experienced in hip replacements and people under the age of 80 years. You see, I had this perception that hip replacements were for old people. And I still had the belief that you would only get 10 years out of a replaced body part, which meant that I was potentially looking at another three or four replacements of this hip. Now, I know that's rubbish now, but at the time, this was what was going on for me. So more than just somebody who was experienced in hip replacements in people younger than 80, I actually wanted somebody who was keeping up to date with medical trends and with medical innovations around surgery. And when I thought about this, I actually had a lot of wants. I wanted somebody who wanted to know me, not just my body part. I wanted somebody with a decent bedside manner. I wanted somebody who could explain all of my options and help me make an informed decision. And then I just realized I didn't want experience because experience on its own is not enough. I also wanted somebody who was at the forefront of current medical advice and technology when it comes to specifically replacing hips. You see, I was looking for assurance and security. So I wanted them to be able to do the do, but I also wanted them to know what to do. So I wanted an expert. So I interviewed quite a few orthopedic surgeons. Yes, that was an expensive exercise. Um, and the expert came when he actually said to me, Joe, I can help you make the right decision for now and in the future if we decide not to proceed with surgery. That was the, that was the best expertise I could have found because for me, there was so much anxiety around what could go wrong. I'm a health professional. We live in a risk management environment every day. We're always thinking about what could go wrong. I needed an expert who was not only competent, I needed an expert who could make me feel confident in them. That was so important for me. Now, I haven't needed a hip replacement. And in fact, my function and my pain has improved out of sight, whereas there's nothing changed on the medical imaging. Uh, it still looks awful when people see the medical imaging, but my pain and my function has improved dramatically. But I had to choose to stop running. And for me, being able to make that choice was facilitated by my expert. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has stories of wanting to find medical experts. And in 2016, a friend of mine reached out to me for help with her teenager. She had a, a child who was completing the HSC in New South Wales. So I don't know about you, my son actually completed it as well. And it's a really stressful time and also for the children. <laughs> 
So her child was experiencing symptoms of anxiety that were really quite concerning. She was right to be concerned. We had lack of sleep. We had uh, overcommitment to uh, hours and endeavor. We had irritability. We had really negative self-talk going on. Um, and we had lots of rumination around not being good enough. It, it wasn't really pleasant at all. Uh, so my friend had done the right thing. She'd taken a child uh, to the GP and the GP said, yep, you've, uh, here's the DAS. They gave her the DAS. DAS said significant symptoms of anxiety, apparently. I don't know. I didn't see it. That's what she reported. Um, and she was told to call a name of a psychologist. So then my friend called the name and was told that they didn't have any vacancies. But there was no assistance to try and find an alternative. It was just like, no, we're not seeing new patients. And my friend was stuck. So she did what most parents who, who don't work in health would do is that she, you know, did a Google search looking for child, well, look, no, she didn't even do child psychology. She just went psychologist in the name of her town. And she ended up with so many listings and she was overwhelmed. So she was brave and she called the next one on the list, um, basically the person she saw in front of her face. And they told her that they could only see her child during school hours. So that's important because this is a child doing the HSC who is anxious about performance. So trying to take this child out of school wasn't really the first place to start. My friend was really, really stuck. So I asked her, what type of person are you looking for? So I moved right away from your doctor said, you need a psychologist. Let me help you find a psychologist. I, what do you need in a psychologist? What do you need in somebody who can help your child? And my friend responded with this, an expert in young people, someone who gets my child, who can help my child and help me help my child. I don't just want a psychologist. I need an expert in this stuff. Um, I put that in quotation marks because I actually wrote down what she said. Uh, it was so empowering and powerful at the time where she had used the word expert twice. I want an expert in young people. I need an expert in this stuff. She didn't want to just go to any psychologist and she'd had two fairly unsatisfactory uh, communications with psychologists or, or rep representatives of psychology teams. So she was starting to feel a bit, you know, frazzled and despondent and like, how the hell am I supposed to find somebody? Yeah. You, anyway, some, some insights there as well. It doesn't just happen to psychologists, by the way. This was just the example that I was having. So what this has helped me understand is that expertise matters to our clients. Therefore, it needs to matter to us. And it's actually one marketing tactic that we have at our disposable, disposal, sorry, not disposable, that we can use ethically and professionally. So I know so many health professionals struggle with marketing and sales. We see a lot of non-health professional business coaches encouraging people to do stuff that we know is unethical and unprofessional. And if we ever got caught, we would become unlicensed very quickly. And we don't, no one ever wants to come across as a sleazy salesperson. That's not what we became health professionals for. So expertise is powerful. Our clients are looking for it. And it's a marketing tactic that we can actually employ ethically and professionally. So why does expertise matter to our clients? Well, to be frank with you, in 2018, nobody wants a generalist. Nobody wants to see a generalist anything. Our clients and our prospective clients want the opportunity to know us, like us, but more importantly, they're wanting to trust us. Being able to explain and articulate our expertise helps us to build trust. Trust allows our clients and our prospective clients to feel assured that we know what we're doing. We actually ask people to trust us when they are at their most vulnerable. Why should they do that? And they actually don't know what we know. For us, our expertise can often feel like common sense. Like, doesn't everybody know this? But really, it isn't. We've just been doing it for so long and we find it so useful and we've set up all those neural pathways that for us, it's just common sense. So then why does expertise matter to us? Well, apart from being a really attractive, professional, ethical marketing tactic, expertise needs to matter to us in terms of how we look after ourselves because clients that we don't enjoy working with are a leading cause of burnout. And clients we are not skilled at helping or where we feel helpless 
are also a leading cause of burnout. Expertise needs to matter to us because we want to be successful. We want to know that we're helping the right people, the people that we are best able to serve. And what I hear time and time again from clinicians all over the world, and yes, I do work with clinicians all over the world, is that they're all seeking freedom, flexibility, and fulfillment. And we see a lot of stuff online about the laptop lifestyle, and we all want freedom and flexibility, but for health professionals, there is a massive piece around fulfillment. None of us are really good at going to work and just doing the basics. Most of us want to know that we've made a significant contribution to the life of a person. So expertise helps us on our journey to discover what it's going to take for us to experience success, which has to do with creating a work and life that allows us to experience freedom, flexibility, and fulfillment. So why would you listen to me? Who am I and where have I come from? So I'm a rehabilitation counsellor, so that's some bizarre degree. I actually qualified uh, back in 1994. Yes, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been 20 years in practice, meaning I have been seeing clients for 20 years. I'm based in the uh, Blue Mountains, west of Sydney, and I have my own private practice, which is called Purple Co. Purple Co is a truncation of purpose for people, and we're about helping people make work work. We connect people to their sense of purpose, and then we make work work for them. Now, I'm also a mentor and a coach to allied health professionals like you, and I've been doing that for about five years now. So I'm not new to some of the issues that come up because I've built my own practice, I've built practices for other people, uh, and I'm still doing this. Um, it's really important to me that we have a health system that is sustainable. It's really important to me that we have health professionals who want to stay and continue to provide clinical services. We all know that healthcare is becoming more expensive. People are living longer. We are living with chronic illnesses and diseases. Our Medicare system is not equipped to help that. It, it, that's not what it was designed for. And we've got to make some fundamental changes. And one of the changes we need to make is health professionals need to stop burning out. Stepping down from my soapbox. It might surprise you to know that I'm actually shy and quite an introvert. No, you're not, Joe. You're not shy. I actually am. No, you're not. You're not an introvert. I see you everywhere. You're all over social media. Yeah, I, I don't actually enjoy it. I do it because it works. <laughs> um, I do have a very um, vulnerable video series over on Facebook, if anybody is interested, where you'll probably see a lot more of my introvertness and shyness come out. But when I um, was starting in practice and then throughout my career up until about five years ago, I would avoid saying that I was an expert in anything. I never knew what to say because I'm a rehabilitation counsellor. And seriously, most people don't even know what that is as a discipline. Um, I actually have an undergraduate. So I, I went to university with the OTs, the physios, the speeches. Uh, it wasn't a master's program when I went through. So I, I, I'm actually classified as an allied health professional. But most people get stuck on the word rehabilitation and assume that all I know about is drug and alcohol. I know nothing about drug and alcohol apart from the fact that I'm not a good fit for that work. So for me, learning how to express what my expertise was was so liberating because it allowed me to actually not go, I'm a rehabilitation counsellor and then be confused by what I was supposed to say next when people said, what's that? But I always tripped over my words, which made me feel stupid. And the cry of my heart was, just give me the clients and let me do good work. As I'm not the only one. And then I realised that no one knew about my good work unless they were told, that clients and prospective clients don't automatically make this leap from, oh, Joe, you did that with person X to therefore you can help me. They don't see it. It's like, oh, that's nice. Good for that client. They don't transfer how that could relate to them. On intake calls, I always had people asking me, what's your expertise? Referral partners were constantly asking, what's your area of expertise? And then I realized that expertise mattered and I need to matter about expertise. So if I was going to be successful, I really needed to get my head around being an expert because people were expecting it from me. But then we have a couple of problems. 
One of them being is how on earth do we define expert? So I'm going to ask you again, and I'll give you a little bit of white noise to think about it. <laughs> what words and phrases do you use when you think of defining an expert? What comes up for you? Well, getting some clarity around what an expert is, is, is a little bit tricky because we actually don't have a reliable or a consistent definition. I'm actually going to segue right now and help you understand something about me. I have read, reread and had somebody proofread my slides, but there will be spelling errors in them. So I am going to offer a free gift to the person who can find the most spelling errors in my slides. Just thought I'd put it out there. What is an expert? So I went to Google like we do these days and typed in what is an expert? And this is the definition that came up. So we can see here that it's a noun and an adjective. So it's a person who is very knowledgeable about or skillful in a particular area. I think most of us would go, yeah, that sounds okay. As an adjective, it's about having or involving a great deal of knowledge or skill in a particular area. And I think it's really interesting for me that it's knowledgeable or skillful. Knowledgeable or skillful. So for me, when I was looking for an expert, I wanted both. So then I went to the research because, you know, I'm a good health professional and I go to the research. So there's a link to an article there. I'm not going to bring it up in my web browser because my internet likes to crash. But this um, particular study that was done highlighted that there are two potentially different types of expertise. Those whose expertise is a function of what they know, knowledge, and those who can perform a skill well. What was really unhelpful about this research paper is that both one and two, so knowledge and skill, are valid and often reliable, but they may actually contradict each other, but by virtue of their own expertise, they will still be correct. So I actually found that confusing and frustrating, but it actually helped me understand when I'm called in to do medical legal assessments, why we have so much argy-bargy going on. So one paper is never enough, and I'm, I've only gone to two. Uh, in, I, I actually read a lot more than two in preparing for today, but I'm only going to share with you two because I found this other article which was written differently as well. But again, it highlighted that there are a couple of definitions. Those who know how, the ability to carry out their actions. And then this article started to look at the use of the experience over time. And again, we're left with some limitations and being able to clearly define what an expert is. So for us as health professionals, we need to get it right. We hate not getting it right. It really bugs us when we don't get it right. So a lot of us get stuck on this word of expert, number one, because we don't, I'll get to this in a minute, but we don't want the criticism of our peers. But also it's like, I don't have the knowledge. I might have the experience, but I don't have the knowledge. I don't have a PhD, but I've been doing this for 20 years. Like we think we need to have both. And my understanding and my request for an expert, I wanted both. So is it any wonder we as health professionals struggle with this? So we don't have a clear definition from the research of what an expert is. And in fact, we can actually become a little bit confused. So are we thinking academics or practice, or are we looking at the demonstration of knowledge and skills? So this is why I come back to this commonly accepted definition, because what we are wanting to do is not get it right. We want to help people understand who we are, how we help, and how our expertise does this. So let's not get hung up on what the definition of an expert is and start thinking about the fact that our clients want to know this stuff about us. What I know to be true. In 2018, our clients, our prospective clients and our employers are actually wanting us to have expertise. To be competitive in the marketplace and in our careers, we need to articulate our areas of expertise. And as I've already stated, clinicians find this really hard. And being able to articulate our expertise is more about helping people know who we are, how we can help them, and why they might want to engage with us. And let's face it, 
Who does not love the engaged client? So what I also know to be true is expertise allows us to achieve our definition of success, attract the type of clients to us that we want to work with, and build a career and a work life that is less likely to lead to burning out. So how, Joe? how? I know you're sitting there going, Joe. I came on this call. I want to know how I uncover it. Well, there's two parts to this. So we're going to start working on part one. So this is where you need to re-engage and start listening again because you've actually got some work to do. <laughs> yes, I can be bossy. So the first step here is I want you to answer some questions. What is it about your work that you find effortless? Not easy, two different things, but effortless. The stuff that comes naturally to you, that stuff that feels like common sense, the stuff that you go, doesn't everybody know this? Another way to think about that is what is your zone of genius? Now, there's an author, his name is Gay Hendricks, and he wrote a great book and he talks about this concept of your zone of genius. What is it that you do that lights you up? No, jot it down. There's no right or wrong answers. And like Serena said, we can't see you. So nobody is sitting here critiquing you. You're not arrogant. You're not being disrespectful. This is about uncovering your expertise. And a part of your expertise is the stuff you love to do. Because it's the stuff you do over and over and over again because you love it and you've gotten good at it, and you find it easy, and you've got muscle memory for it, and you've got neurology for it, and you've got brain plasticity for it. You don't have to feel guilty about loving a part of your job. Our work is hard enough. We're allowed to do the stuff we like. So what lights you up? What gets you excited? And why do we want to focus on this? We want to become confident in saying, well, I'm an expert in because we want to captivate. I've already shown you how our customers and prospective customers, employers, they want to know that we're an expert. We can't say I'm an expert in making people feel good about themselves and say it in a really timid and questioning manner. We want to be captivating. We want people to go, I am an expert in helping people take back control of their life. I am an expert in helping women reclaim their career. I am an expert in helping young people make better decisions about their life. Nobody wants a generalist, even GPs, especially the general practitioners, GPs, especially have you have specializing. Have you noticed? Nobody wants a generalist anymore. So what's getting in our way? Cause I know stuff is coming up from you. I have run this workshop. I have run this as a half day workshop. I've run this as a whole day seminar. I know this becomes uncomfortable. So what gets in our way? As clinicians, we are terrified of getting it wrong. Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier. We work in a risk management environment all the time. And if we get it wrong, there are big consequences. There are massive consequences for our clients. If we get it wrong, whatever it is, if we make a wrong prescription, if we, don't, if we haven't done a thorough enough assessment, if um, somebody um, omits a piece of evidence and or inf information and we can't, uh, get a measurement right. If we get it wrong, we, we judge ourselves so harshly and we often get filled with shame and incredible guilt and we are terrified of getting it wrong. And, and with good reason, if we get it wrong and harm people, we can get sued. If we get sued, we can lose our livelihood. If we lose our livelihood, that's pretty catastrophic. So getting it wrong is a big deal. As clinicians, we are also terrified of the criticism of our peers. Don't know if you've noticed, but we're actually not very nice to each other. Uh, and nurses, I'm going to single you out. If there are any nurses on this call, you seem to be incredibly awful to each other. And I don't know what that's about. But, but as, a, as a whole, allied health professionals, we like to criticize each other. But, but the, ter the, the criticism is actually terrifying and it's, it's devaluing and it's demeaning. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have critical thought, but that the judgment that comes with criticism is, is really wounding us. And we are terrified of not being good enough. We are terrified that we have worked so hard and done so much good stuff, but we just essentially deep down, we are scared that we are not good enough. 
we can't cut it and someone's going to find out. No wonder we struggle to call ourselves an expert. So how, Joe? how do I uncover my expertise? Step number one, what do you find effortless? What's your zone of genius and what lights you up? Let's go with that. Start here. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds again to, um, to jot down some more ideas for yourself. But I also know that our heads and all the head trash talk that goes on for us can get in our way. And for a lot of us, it's much easier to talk about our clients and the successes our clients have achieved. After all, we were all taught in any discipline that we have studied that we facilitate a process of recovery or healing for a client, but it's the client's journey. And that kind of removes us from the success of that a little bit because we want it to be all about the client. And I don't think there would be anybody on this call who would not stole the values of client-centered work, not clinician-centered work. I think we can do both, but that's a story for another day. So let's, let's look at a way we can extrapolate our expertise by thinking about some of our clients. So I want you to think of three case study or client examples of clients that you have loved to work with. And it doesn't matter why you've loved it. That's not important. I just don't want you ruminating on things that didn't work for you. So jot down their names because nobody can see it. This information doesn't go anywhere. You're not breaching any privacy. Three case study client examples. Then I want you to think about what change did you help each of these clients to make? So under client name one, what was the change you helped them make? Not your method. And I'm going to get to that in a minute, but what change did you help them to make? So they arrived uh, your first time you saw them and they were usually sad or in pain, or there was something that needed to be fixed or changed. So what, did you help these clients to do? What change did you help them make? Was it independence? Was it fulfillment? Was it empowerment? Was it transformation? Was it I could drive again? Um, what change did you help these three clients make? And this one's probably going to take a little bit longer than we've got time for on this webinar today, but this is such a powerful and valuable exercise. How did you actually take your client from A to B? Now, again, this is not your method. I'm not interested in saying I applied the theory of um, attachment therapy or I used technique XYZ, CPT, ACT, NLP. That Nobody really cares about that. We as clinicians care about that, but nobody else really does. How, how did you take your client from A to B? Did you educate? Did you inform? Did you demonstrate? Did you bamboozle them? Did you high five them? Did you inspire? How did you take them? So usually it starts with, I helped my client grow in awareness around issue. I, then gave them some options on what it is we might like to be able to do together. Then they were making some goals around what it is they wanted to achieve. Then we broke those goals down and looked at the action plans that we could put in place and some of the techniques or tactics that I could teach or resource them with. Then we implemented as health professionals, we implement, we are always implementing. We implemented and then we refined and then we implemented some more and then we refined and then I had to do some counseling because all of us are counseling all the time as well, because our clients are going to come up against their barriers. So how did you take your client from A to B? It's a really powerful exercise to do this as a flow chart, to actually map it out. How did you take your client from, I feel awful when I walked into the room, but then when I left, I feel amazing. So think about that. I'm going to keep moving on because I know that exercise is, is powerful. And I think if you go back and look at this recording, you're going to get some clues and stop on this slide um, and, and help yourself. You can take yourself through this. 
I just want you to remember it's not, not your method. Then what we do is once we've got the case studies and we've answered those questions underneath those case studies, what are the commonalities across all three? There will be themes. There's out of three clients, it's usually one theme, but you might have a couple of themes. And another way to think about this, what did you contribute to which would not have occurred if you were not involved? So if we took you out of this person's life, where would this person be? What would they be doing or not doing? So we work with a lot of clients who are, who are high functioning following brain injury. And we have learned that if we weren't in their lives, they would, their, their functioning would deteriorate because we have a skill set and an ability to help people with brain injuries who are really high functioning maintain their function by helping them stay engaged, which means we're often finding new ways to engage them frequently, sometimes every six weeks. We're looking at new ways to help them stay stimulated without stimulating them or overstimulating them. We're constantly needing to uh, revisit goals and plans and, and affirmation, so much affirmation. Um, so it's not all about cognition. It's not all about structure and memory and planning. We, they, they actually get the need for that. They just get bored with it. So that's one of the things that's not our method, but it's, it's one of the ways we help these clients make amazing gains. I've got a young man at the moment, he's 21, who's holding down three jobs while doing a traineeship. He wasn't even supposed to leave hospital. Telling those types of stories, that's, where we, that's another marketing tool that we've got that we can talk about, but it won't be today. So what do we do with this? I'm an expert in, we want to captivate, we want to sound certain, we want to inspire confidence in, in the people listening to us. Remembering that nobody wants a generalist anymore. You don't want the generalist, I don't want the generalist, our clients really don't want the generalist. So here are some phrases that I've helped my clients in the past come up with. Now a couple of these are mine, but a couple of them aren't. <laughs> and you'll see that because you'll be like, I don't think Joe does that. So I'm an expert in helping people take back control of their lives. I say that about the work we do in Purple Co all the time. And I think pretty much any occupational therapist, uh, physiotherapist working in the community, speech pathologist can probably use that statement because that's kind of what we do. I've had other people say I'm an expert in helping women let go of the shame and guilt of being a career loving mum. I'm glad that we have experts like that around these days. Uh, I'm an expert in empowering teenagers to make body positive decisions. Hmm. I'm an expert in helping people return to work following injury, illness and trauma. That's another one of mine. And I'm an expert in empowering parents to communicate effectively with their nonverbal child. So as you can see, this is not your method. This is not saying I'm an expert in CBT. I'm not an expert in DBT. I'm not an expert in pediatrics. Our clients and our prospective clients actually don't know what that means. And to be honest, there are a lot of other referral partners and people in the medical system who actually don't know what it means either. Or they've put it in a box that's unhelpful for you when they're sending you referrals. So your turn. Yes, I know. It's come up already. What are you an expert in? Just let it roll out of your tongue. Say it out loud. We can't hear you. What are you an expert in? Is anyone smiling and laughing? I'd love to know if anyone made themselves laugh about this. <laughs> So how did we uncover your expertise? Well, we did it by thinking about what lights you up. What do you find effortless? That's some really, really good clues there. I uh, am very competent in a lot of things. I'm incredibly competent at medico-legal assessments, but I don't want to do as many. I, I used to do seven a month. I just don't want to do that volume anymore. And I think I have an incredible level of expertise around them, but it doesn't light me up anymore. 
I actually don't find them effortless. <laughs> I can tell you that there is nothing effortless for me around a medico legal report. For me, effortless is a gentleman in his 50s who was the CEO of a large multinational company who's had a heart attack and ended up with a major depressive illness who wants to go back to work. For me, that sort of work is effortless. If we got a referral for a 45-year-old non-English speaking forklift operator with a sore back who's managing his 10 out of 10 pain with a Panadol, I don't know what to do with that. That does not light me up and that does not help me. That, that's not effortless. So what lights you up? Is it when that child comes into the room and says hello when they haven't been able to speak? Is it that parent who calls you in tears saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping me? Is, that is it the teenager who goes, I haven't cut myself in over a week. I'm so grateful for you. What is it that lights you up? And then the second part of this is what is the common themes we find when we help our clients? Because that is going to give us massive clues to what our expertise is. So it's self-reflection is hard. This is confronting. I get it. But it's also liberating, empowering, and totally transformational. So what are we going to do with this information now that we've got it? Because you've learned something new about yourself today. Even if you're still not comfortable with the word expert, you have learned something new about yourself today. So now that you're becoming more comfortable in your expertise, and I said more comfortable, not comfortable, because I know a lot of you listening to this aren't comfortable yet. How are you going to use this new knowledge effectively? Well, I want to help you understand a really simple process that you can use in marketing and networking in conversations with people over the phone. We're going to start, it's five steps. I've tried to break this down in very linear sequential process because we're health professionals and that's what we do. We're going to start off with my name is, then we're going on to I'm an expert in, I love to help people too, I am passionate about, and I am best able to help. If you can get this conversation started when somebody, um, you turn up to a networking event or you meet somebody at a dinner party, if you can get that information out, you are going to engage and captivate people so easily. And you will then very quickly be able to talk about how you work with clients and take all the pressure off why should we choose you? Because I know as health professionals, that's what we would much prefer. So let's break this down. My name is, seriously, we really do need to start there. If they don't know your name, please tell them your name. You're a person first. So my name is Joe. There's just, we are more than the work we do. We need to reinforce that for ourselves and for others. So we can all do step one so easily because we all know our name. Success. I'm an expert in. So this comes from the work you do with steps one and two. What is your zone of genius? What comes easy to you? What feels like common sense? So my name is Jo. I'm an expert in helping people to return to work following injury, illness, and trauma. So then we come to step three. I love to help people too. Now, when you're uncovering your expertise, this comes from the exercise, step two in your exercise, because nobody really cares about your method. And when we talk about how we love to help people, we want to solve a problem or fix the pain. So my name is Jo. I'm an expert in helping people to return to work following injury, illness, and trauma. I love to help people to regain their life by re-establishing their capacity to earn an income. I am best, I am passionate about, oops, sorry, forgot. <laughs> so this step comes from one. This, this is the, when we did what, what lights you up. This is what you're passionate about. This is the stuff that you could talk about forever and a day. It allows you to lift the energy in the conversation. It helps people to know that you care. And it also makes you interesting. It also makes you interesting. So you can tell I'm really passionate about the work I do just because of the way I talk about this. But I am passionate about getting people off benefits. I do not want anyone to have to tell me that because of a sickness, an injury, an illness, a disability, that I have to live on a fixed income for the rest of my life. I just think that's ridiculous. 
We have so much accessibility and technology and opportunity and re-engineering. And we have so many clever people in our world these days. All people who want to work will find a way. I want to be a part of that. I really want to be a part. And I'm so passionate about that because the more people that we can help get back to work, what, a, what an enriched community and society we will have. And work is so much more than just earning an income. Research actually tells us that if people don't work, they actually suffer worse health. And we actually have increased mortality rates for people who aren't at work. But that's not what this webinar is all about. But I do think Serena wants me to talk about that one day. So... The last part of this puzzle, I am best able to help. So who are you best able to help? Now, why is this really important? Because it's like, Joe, I'm just restating everything. Well, you're not restating everything. You're actually making it really easy for people to refer to you. We've got to make it easy for people to refer to us. I am best able to help. So you make it really clear about what you don't do by stating what you do do. And you're also giving people the words to use when discussing you. So we do not work with kids here at Purple Co. It's not a good fit for us. Um, and I say that by we are best able to help adults who, who want to know how to, how to go back to work. We can do that in a couple of ways. We re-engineer a person's job or we help them find a job that's a good fit for them. I am best able to help people who want to go back to work. It's that simple. We don't need lots of jargon. We don't need lots of therapy speak. We just need to make this clear and concise. So we have, I have doctors in Victoria. I'm based in Sydney. I have a psychiatrist in Victoria who whenever she has somebody in her clinic who says to her, I think I'm ready to go back to work or I think I need to find a new job, she calls me. Now, we can't always serve her clients, but we do take a lot of private clients these days, so we're becoming more open to that. But that's just, we're her go-to person. That's what we do. This takes practice. You are not going to get the comfort that you're craving in this one-hour webinar. You're just not. It's not going to happen. It takes practice. And you're going to feel a little bit uncomfortable at first. This is new. Who knows that every time you do something new, it is a tad uncomfortable. <laughs> Not as uncomfortable as me needing two celebrates to get through a running session, but it's uncomfortable. We ask clients to get uncomfortable every day. We can get uncomfortable with this. So if you can expect that you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable, then you can take the pressure off yourself to get it right and you can actually go and have some fun with it. Find out what works for you. You've got to practice this so it rolls off your tongue. Uh, my, my practice building clients and I have an exercise where I actually get them to do this on video uh, and they have to send me the video and that takes some work, but it gets them practicing. So that's something you could do. The other option is talk to yourself in the mirror so that you can see what you're saying and laugh at yourself because seriously, you will need to laugh at yourself. <laughs> All right, so let's go back over this again. How did we uncover your expertise? So we did it by finding out what lights you up and what is effortless. And we talked about how your clients experience you. And as a bonus, I've given you some extra information on what to do once it's uncovered because it would have been great to just uncover it. But then, great, Joe, what do we do with that? So I've given you a really, really cool uh, method for structuring a sentence or a conversation when you go to marketing uh, events or networking events or when somebody says, what do you do? How do you help? What's your expertise? So we've got some language for it now. And who knows that language is so empowering. So we've got 10 minutes to go and I just wanted to share with you some stuff. So often when I present on these forums, people go, Joe, how can I get more of you? How can I talk to you? Um, I've, you've opened up a can of worms. What are we going to do next? How are we going to do some more stuff? So, you, you no doubt will agree that this one hour today isn't going to be enough to get you where you want to go. So I'm often asked how people can learn more from me. So I wanted to share with you the Success Mindset Masterclass. So this is a two-day event where I will help you gain greater impact by getting out of your own way. Seriously. So today is a tiny, tiny part of that two-day event. You're going to experience success. And to do that, we need to address the three things. We need to address who we are, who we serve, and how to take that message to market. 
everybody wants to jump ahead and go to the marketing tactics and finding the clients. And we forget that we've got to focus on who we are first. And I get why we go and do the marketing hacks and the tactics and all of that. They're really important, but there is often a massive mismatch between who we are, who we serve and how we take that message to market because people have not spent any time on the who we are bit. So I don't think you need another marketing tactic or hack. We really need to stop and work out why we keep sabotaging ourselves. We need to address this overriding fear that we're not good enough because it's turning up every single day. Then we need to develop a realistic and actionable plan with the right supports in place to stop us from repeating these unhelpful behaviors. So in essence, we need to work on you before we get to them. And by them, I mean your clients and your customers. So this Success Mindset Masterclass, I've run this in the US before, uh, but this year I've been asked uh, by the Australian College of Applied Psychology to run it here in Sydney. So it's actually the first time it's being offered in Australia. It's two full days on May 25 and 26, plus there's eight weeks of online coaching support. So yeah, it's a two day event, but it's actually eight weeks, if that makes sense any sense. So we have a price. It's $9.90, including GST. That's for the two days. You will be fed your lunch, uh, morning and afternoon tea, because I don't function without coffee. And there's also a, a, a cocktail event on the Thursday night. There's a bonus for March only. People who pay and register in March will buy one ticket. Ooh, found a mistake. Buy one ticket and you will get one free because I know how confronting it can be to come to these events on your own and you just want somebody in the room to help you feel safe. So what are you going to get? Two full days of training and implementation in the room. You're going to learn about your personality style and how this affects your behavior. You're going to develop your own criteria for success. Mm -hmm. You're going to identify your self-sabotage behaviors because we've all got them. Then we're going to develop the plan to address your self-sabotage and you'll have an opportunity for the hot seat experience, which is where I actually coach people live in the room. Uh, some of you will hate that. Some of you will love that. So what are you going to create from this two day event? You will create certainty around your personal criteria for success and how to achieve it. You will create the ability to interrupt your self-sabotage and you will create a plan to address your risks and your triggers. So you will create confidence, assurance, and amazing connection, connections with other like-minded people. Every event I ever run, people end up doing business with each other. I am a strong connector and I'm very good at helping people work out how they can work together. That's just, that's a part of my zone of genius. Didn't know that I was good at it. <laughs> All right, bonuses. The bonuses are the secret Facebook group. So secret means no one else can find it uh, just for participants for two months, which means you've got ongoing support for two months after the event to implement what you learn. Because I don't know about you, but I go to all these, I go to events and I'm like all hyped up and excited in the moment, but I never implement anything because I get so busy in my life. Uh, there's a cocktail welcome evening or a welcome evening that's cocktail style. I don't think I've worded that well. And I'm going to gift everybody a copy of my workbook from clinician to entrepreneur, why goal setting doesn't always work. And for the month of March, your bonus is if you register and pay, you get one, you'll get a free ticket. So that's incredible value. Um, ACAP have been an incredible sponsorship partner for me. So that's why I'm able to run this at such a, um, a low cost. So there is a web page and I'm a bit nervous about sharing it with you because it isn't perfect yet, but there it is. And if you've got questions, you can email me. And there are also lots of ways that you can contact me. So I can see Serena has popped up. I'm not, I'm gonna throw over to her now, which means I'm probably almost over time. Oh, hurrah. Thank you, Serena. <laughs> You're awesome. Thanks so much. Um, that was so incredibly valuable for me personally, and I'm sure it is for everybody listening. We all have so many of the same issues, don't we? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, very empowering. I'm sure you've opened lots of cans of worms uh, all over the country. I have, uh, there's one quick question, um, yep. which we're running out of time of. For, but I know you uh, have to run off. Just quickly, um, in two words or less, the zone of genius. Yep. Um, can we get a little bit of clarity around that? And obviously, credit to the author. Yep. So the author is Gay Hendricks. 
cute. The book is The Big Leap. Uh-huh. And it's basically that zone of genius is that stuff that you find effortless. Yeah. Okay. And it's all tied in, hey? Mm-hmm. Who knew that there's so many things we actually find effortless? <laughs> it's, um, it's, I'm glad. Does that mean you wrote some down? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. It was such an empowering exercise for me. It's when I realized that I could let go of all my medical legal work and go, I actually don't have to do I that. I don't anymore. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yep. You're empowering people all over the show. You should be very proud. You're a joy, oh, to, work you. a joy to work with. Um, if anybody has any more questions, please grab Jo. She's all over everything like a rash. Have a look at all her details. <laughs> like a rat. <laughs> Um, and of course, the details are on our website as well. Okay, so thanks again, Joe. That was amazing. We will uh, twist Joe's arm and see if we can get her to present uh, another topic later in the year. Um, have a look at our website, yeah. allyhealthvirtualconference.com.au. We have millions of things happening, coming and going, clinical business based webinars for you to access whenever you wish. We also are the home of Australian Allied Health Awards brand new this year it's very exciting take a look at that website nominate yourself nominate a colleague get involved it's uh, alliedhealthawards.com.au okay we better head off thanks so much for joining us